Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I'm so happy and grateful to have Samantha Foster, Foster with us here today, who's the founder and president of nonprofit Rethink Mental Health Incorporated. Through Rethink Mental Health Incorporated, she has created a mental health curriculum that has reached thousands of children, hosted mental health speaking engagements and workshops for employees at multinational companies, built a team of almost 100 mental health advocates from around the world, and so much more. Samantha, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you today because I think I shared with you in our earlier conversation we had, I have been deeply concerned about what the mental health fallout from COVID is going to be. And, and maybe we could start with first, what brought you into this area where you founded Rethink Mental Health and what, what's kind of your journey that brought you there? Of course. Um, so I have my own um, you know, mental health journey, essentially. Um, and there's, of course, many long versions and many short versions. <laughs> But um, the, the gist of it being that um, for essentially as long as I can remember from childhood, I have always struggled um, with my mental health. And I went through a, a long period in my adolescence of misdiagnosis, of um, mistreatment, being on medications that both didn't work and also had adverse effects um, because of that misdiagnosis. And it led me to essentially, you know, really hitting a rock bottom and a point of hopelessness um, around the age of 22. Um, when I realized that after 10 years of all these different attempts, nothing was really working. And I never really could feel that sense of stability that I, I knew should be in my grasp. Um, it led me to being completely re-diagnosed um, and reassessed. Um, I received my proper diagnosis and therefore could actually work to improve my mental health proactively. And through that experience, I gained so much empowerment and I was so invigorated to be able to be proactive about my mental health and, and view it not from this scary, shameful way that I had been honestly brought up to view it as, as a child even, um, and something so negative that there's something wrong with me and it's this big dark secret that I have to keep and that I burden those around me because of it, but rather something that was Yes, some a struggle that I definitely had to overcome, and and that's that's no fun, obviously. But something that I had more control over, and I could find more ways to embrace it, and open up about it, and be embraced by the community, um, and not be so afraid of these stigmas. Um, and so through that journey uh, along my path of wellness, I really realized there are so many others who suffer in silence, and who don't know not only that we don't have to stigmatize mental health as a society and we can be more accepting and supporting of one another but also there are so many ways for us to be proactive about mental health and find the right journey for us to be well and 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 ideally happy and healthy there was something you said there there are a couple of things i want to come back to sure it, it's, it seemed like you, i heard you say there was there was this perception of it being very scary and there's a shame and i've heard a lot of people and i know i've experienced it's, it's such a fascinating thing, right? We we suffer in silence because often there's such a shame going on. Like we should suck it up, you know, big boys, mm -hmm. big girls don't cry. You should have this all figured out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we then we start to bury and bury and bury. And what I heard, I think I heard you say there is that once you're able to start kind of reconciling some of those emotions, you realize that there's a lot more things you could do proactively to better and improve your mental health. Yeah. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, one of the biggest side effects of the stigma, like you're saying, and that shame is again, kind of keeping things locked in and, and suffering in silence. When we do that, we also are keeping ourselves from seeking proper help, from talking to other people who may be able to give us insight into what's going on with us or just inspire us and make us feel again that we're not alone. I think that's one of the biggest injustices in mental health is so many of us think that no one else could possibly feel the way we feel. And yes. while everyone has their own unique experiences, it's not to say that, you know, everyone shares exactly the same experience, but there are so many people out there who you can relate to, who you can see as inspiring. Um, and that's the foundation and the foundation founding concept for our organization's advocacy program, which invites individuals from literally around the world. We have almost a hundred advocates at this point, and we're not even at an, a year since founding the advocate program. But these are individuals from around the world, all of whom have their own unique mental health struggles. Some of them have been in supporting roles of people with mental health issues. Some of them are professionals in the mental health field, really any background. 
Um, but what they have in common is this same kind of desire and passion to help advocate for those out there who are suffering in silence and be a voice for the voiceless to help kind of bring them out of the shadows and say, Hey, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. And you're not Mm. alone in what you're going through. How do you, how do you help or how do you begin to approach the shame piece with people when somebody comes and they're, they're saying they're recognizing that they want to work and improve on their mental health how do you begin to address shame? Because it seems like inevitably that's such a cornerstone piece of where we struggle with mental health. Yeah. Um, So on an external basis, it's combating the stigma as a society. The more our society can show itself to be empathetic and understanding, the less shame there will be because that shame is imprinted by what we view other people or we perceive other people will think of us first and foremost. Um, So the more we can create a culture that is understanding of mental health that can help view mental health the same way we view physical health, which is that yes, everyone is different. And that even though it's not always visible to the naked eye, like a um, a physical illness can be, it still is there, it's real, it's tangible. And it is something that is being experienced. And the same token, we all have mental health the same way we have physical health. We may not all have mental health struggles. We may have all varying degrees of mental health struggles, just like physical health and physical wellness, Um, but it is real and tangible and affects all of us and can affect all of us. And I think the pandemic is a perfect example of something that proves that the world is, is a chaotic place. We're all subject to adversity and therefore we are all subject to feel the impacts emotionally and mentally of, of life's challenges. It is such a curious thing how even with all the science, all the research out there, we still struggle so much with this, this notion of nobody understands, nobody gets it, nobody feels how I feel, no one has gone through what I've, I've gone through. And it's, it's inevitably, it's almost like we start to imprison ourselves in our mind, right? And we, we lock ourselves away and we, the, only, the only audience we have is our own thoughts. And especially, specifically those thoughts that often fuel the, the mental health struggles and challenges. Mm-hmm. How do, so someone who's listening, watching right now and, and somebody who's struggling with that inner monologue, or maybe they know someone who's struggling with that inner monologue, what are some steps that they could begin doing or some actions they could take to perhaps start to make a positive movement forward for themselves? Sure. So I, I think first and foremost, it's getting it out. And I'll be, I'll be completely frank with everyone. <laughs> I, uh, I think in some ways I started this nonprofit as a scapegoat not to open up. <laughs> mm. It took me um, a while, honestly, before I shared my own personal journey um, in public. So I don't mean to say that as a hypocrite. I mean to say that as humbling the fact that it is not easy to open up because there is that fear. Um, And even if you know so many other stories and you see so many other brave individuals who do open up, it doesn't make it any easier. So don't be hard on yourself if you still are keeping this private and you're not ready to open up. But there are many ways for you to open up without having to make yourself public, if that makes sense. That includes maybe writing out a journal, um, you know, journaling your thoughts and your feelings on a daily basis, a weekly basis, making that a part of your routine so that these thoughts and this inner monologue isn't stuck ruminating in your head. Um, maybe that is some sort of artistic expression, if that's your inclination to, again, get these things out of yourself. Or maybe that's speaking to a professional a therapist or a friend that you can confide in that you know you can trust and, and take those baby steps. And when you start doing that, you're going to see that they're really, there's so much more um, acceptance out there than we even perceive. I think we honestly stigmatize mental health internally more than it does exist. And even though maybe not everyone will understand there are many avenues, there are, you know, uh, there are group support groups on social media and in your community um, that you can reach out to with like-minded individuals. And if you go to some of those support groups, they're not going to require you to speak right off the bat. You know, you can speak at your comfort, but you'll be surrounded by people who you'll be able to hear their stories and feel more and more comfortable being able to speak out. So take baby steps and understand that's totally okay and acceptable. You don't have to wear it on your sleeve, but getting it out of your head, off your chest, and being able to process through that is really helpful. As a testimony to that, I was just re-watching a video from 
a few years ago and I had a friend of mine named John who was diagnosed with ALS and we did a conversational series where we kind of recorded his journey through ALS. He wanted to do something proactively to raise awareness and we'd meet every week and I would interview him and we talk and we post a video and, and it really was incredible with him because it gave him this sense of purpose. But the video I came across was him on a day that he really was dealing with fear and he was having anxiety. He was having panic around it, fear of dying. It was, he had a terminal diagnosis. It was very real, very present for him. And we recorded this whole conversation and it was really fascinating because as he vocalized the fear, he talked his way through it. He was able to express what he was going through and what he was afraid of, that it wasn't so much a fear of dying or pain, but a fear of leaving loved ones behind, not being able to have experiences, not being able to enjoy the little things that we all take for granted every day, which at that point in his journey had become much bigger and more meaningful to him. Sure. What was remarkable is it, it came to a point where he said, he said, you know, just talking this out, it feels like, and John was a very, he had a way with words. He said, it feels like just kind of flushing the toilet. I feel this sense of relief <laughs> coming over me. But when you watch the video, you see the a mental and emotional health transformation he undergoes. Mm -hmm. You see somebody who is carrying the weight of this burden, of the suffering and silence, of holding himself hostage to this monologue and these emotions that are very real for him and he's he's struggling with and then just him allowing himself to talk it out just him allowing himself to speak about what he's going on and just me sitting there listening and acknowledging a little bit but mostly just listening yep. it was transformational for him so I, I absolutely can attest to what you were just saying it is so incredibly powerful with that and I love that you gave the options of journaling too because i know some people they're sometimes hesitant to talk to other people or to to go out and chat about it with others because they're afraid somebody's going to say something and it's going to make them worse or it's going to make them seem or appear something like that and yeah it is it's it's incredibly powerful when we just get it out mm -hmm. and some people even i feel can trip up over words i mean that's that's the other thing is that it's to your comfort level i mean even in our advocate program um, our advocates are invited to participate in campaigns that we have, whether they be through social media or, you know, any, anything that we're working on essentially. But I always remind them that it's in their comfort zone. You know, for example, if they aren't uh, big on public speaking, they can, you know, write a blog article or if they love being on camera, then they can make a video clip. But I think that's one of the other things with mental health. Ooh. Sorry. Um, that's one of the other things with mental health is knowing to knowing where your comfort zone is and not being afraid to set those boundaries it's okay we all have boundaries we all have limitations and things that we're better at or more comfortable doing that's not there's nothing to be shameful about that so to know your boundaries and not not feel bad to keep within those um but definitely i mean just being able to get things off your chest and being able to express them not only takes that weight off, but also can really help you process it. And like you said in your your friend's example, how even what you start with, whatever your premise is that you think this is what you're upset about, as you kind of break that down, you may find there's all these underlying, you know, things that you never would have thought of if you didn't really break it down. Or even things in your past, a lot of mental health issues or, or frustrations can actually, you know, relate to experiences from childhood or, or certain, you know, just, things that you saw or were taught growing up. And that's the, the foundation of where these thought processes come from. So understanding the origin is a really great way to also be able to, you know, address that and, and ultimately feel better about it. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Rethink Mental Health Incorporated. What does the organization do? What kind of work are you doing? Who are the people that you're serving? Sure. So Rethink Mental Health Incorporated, as you mentioned, is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to improve the way society views and treats mental health, especially among children and adolescents um, and young adults. Um, our initiatives uh, range uh, into three categories, essentially. We have advocacy, which is really our social outreach. That's our, our proactive um, messages that we're sending into the communities um, to combat the stigma and, again, spread those those notions that you're not alone and what you're going through. Um, and our primary campaign in that is our advocate program because they really are our, our faces to the organization. I, I say this all the time, but it's not the Samantha Foster organization by any means. Um, I like having multiple people because there are so many different faces to mental health and it really shows that it is everyone and anyone. Um, 
We also have um, a mental health curriculum that's for adolescents um, and that reaches students throughout the world, really. We have um, a special relationship with a uh, school counseling foundation in Nepal who's brought our curriculum there and is now the first mental health curriculum of its kind uh, throughout mm. the country in Nepal. Um, and then our third branch is creativity. So in the creativity section, we have um, a, a art gallery. So for artistic expressions of mental health, you could showcase your work there. Um, we have our Field of Music podcast, which showcases music and relates music to our mental health and as an expression and also something that we all use to help kind of motivate us or help us cry or whatever it may be. Um, and our third initiative for the creativity is our Expressions in Ink, which is a literary journal, and that's going to be launched in May. So that'll be our first kind of initiation of that. And the last thing that is just incredible that we're working on right now is our first Field of Music benefit concert. So it's going to be December 4th here in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Brooklyn Bowl, right on the Las Vegas Strip. Um, and it's going to have a, a lineup of, of musicians from our Field of Music podcast. It's going to be an incredible event. Um, and we're just so excited to be pulling this off. Um, so uh, that is another huge thing we're working on to really bring this back to the community, which has been too long. <laughs> That's incredible. You'll have to make sure you send me that link for that yeah. when registration is open and I'll, I'll share it and everything. Of course. I have a, a sneeze coming up, I think. Just give me one second. <laughs> it, it's going to keep us in suspense, so I'll talk over it and then I will let you talk and then I'll, I'll work it through. <laughs> you know, it's always, it's always the sneezes or something else. They, they're kind of like the thoughts in your mind. They show up at unexpected times and then they will linger and persist until you do something about addressing them. And sometimes they just explode out of you. You don't feel like you have control over them, but you do feel better when you, when you, you let it go and you process it. Very true. I want to talk a little bit about what you've experienced, your organization has experienced through COVID. This it's it's April fourteenth at the time of this recording. One of my big concerns through this whole last year is, and I've actually shifted a portion of my business around to really try to address this: is what's the mental health fallout of COVID going to be? Yep. And I've shifted a lot of my speaking engagements focusing on mental health, addressing mental health in workplaces, addressing mental health in organization, because I think it's going to be so catastrophic. I think that we were we were already. We had become so expert at stigmatizing and, and folks who are struggling with it and struggle and not acknowledging our own, you know, th that we all will go through whatever our own struggles. In. And then you have something like COVID that just magnifies it. And we have our, our American media, they just, they, they love the flame. They see a little smoke and they're over there with the fans. I feel like just blowing it. Mm -hmm. and, and you have all these things. And I, I hear stories all the time from people talking about just how stressed they are, how anxious they are, how worried they are, how scared they are to go interact with people, yeah, about hugging yeah. again, whatnot. Have you seen an increase in reach out outreach for you around mental health? And are you giving, are you advising people in any way differently than you would have normally in times of COVID? And are people too, especially with so many folks being home or not traveling as much? I love that you have this suite of tools that they could use and are people finding, like incorporating some of the tools that you're doing in a shelter in place kind of scenario, are they finding real value and benefit to it? So great question and point, because the answer first is just, yes, the, the impact from COVID has been so significant. And it is disappointing to see that the media, while flan fanning the flames of so many topics, has truly not shown too much of an, a a spotlight on mental health as a massive side effect of COVID and the pandemic um, and the lockdowns and all these factors. Um, and and I, I when when the pandemic first happened and and schools began shutting down, so children were staying home and and the first adjustment um, was was so significant across the board. And as we quote unquote adjusted to our new normal, um, you know, the increase in stress and, and fear and loneliness has, has just crippled our society. Um, and that being said, as we, we look towards the future of things opening up, um, as optimistic as I am for things to return to, quote unquote, a new, new normal and be healthy again, uh, another change does not come with another set of its own new problems. So just because things are getting better doesn't mean 
that the mental health situation will get better. Another change is just another form of transition yet again. Um, with that said, yes, we have been able to adapt to this and we offer uh, mental health workshops and speaking engagements uh, virtually. And we've been able to help reach a lot of uh, people through these webinars that we're hosting, whether it be through a company um, to their employees or directly. Um, I even have a, a workplace mental health webinar that I'm hosting this Friday. And I have another one on um, workplace stress and stress management next week. <laughs> um, and then really what it's about is addressing these key things that, are, that, that people are experiencing um, revolve around just the worldview. Um, and a lot of that is anger and frustration. And again, like you said, you know, you turn on the news and it's just horrible all the time. It's yeah. just negative drudgery. And we feel this lack of control with the society that we live in. And that just fuels a lot of anger and, and frustration. And on the other side of things is this loneliness and sadness and, and grieving that we're going through, through losses, whether that be loss of, of, of a loved one, actual life loss, or just loss of connection and human connection, being able to be with our friends and our family members, or also loss of our jobs and our normal routine. So these adjustments are significant. Um, but that being said, there are many tactics to help assist. And a lot of that, again, begins with normalizing that and helping everyone understand that these are extraordinary circumstances. You are allowed to feel that way. You sh there's not you should, but it would be almost abnormal to be 100% okay through all of this <laughs> yeah. because these changes are, are extraordinary. Um, that being said, there are things you can do about it. There are ways you can add peace to your life, whether that be unplugging, which is something I find myself doing more often than not. Um, whether that be, you know, finding a way to really reconnect with people, even if you can't see them in person and get those hugs yet but making sure that you're still socializing and you don't recluse because it's harder to socialize. Um, so there's a lot of different tools um, to help adapt. And a lot of that begins with kind of self-care and assessing where you need that extra support and making sure you're giving yourself the allowance and time to do so. You mentioned, Samantha, unplugging. I'm wondering if you would be open to sharing what are three to five things that you specifically have done through COVID to kind of help you maintain and improve mental health? Are there certain practices I heard unplugging? What else have you been doing? Sure. Um, so unplugging is a big one for me because um, I do find the inundation of negative news to just be uh, just overwhelming. And it doesn't mean that I don't care about social issues or, or being up to date on things, but it means that again, I need to take time for myself and focus on my family and things um, that, are in my present life and that I can also currently control. Um, another thing that I, I've been doing, I actually, I have an eight month old. So I had a baby in the middle of all of this. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, so one thing I, I started doing after the turn of the year has been going on staycations actually, um, in part because I still don't sleep through the night with him <laughs> and a lack of sleep is a massive detriment to your physical and mental health. So it's been my way of getting a full night's sleep of having some time to recharge, of getting a change of scenery. Again, with COVID, we're not traveling as much. We're not, you know, leaving our four walls and that can, that stir crazy, you know, concept can really weigh on you. So it's a way for me to change my scenery for, for you know, 24 hours. Um, other things I've been doing is making sure that I'm staying balanced. Um, you know, for a while we couldn't, we couldn't exercise, we couldn't go to the gym, things like that. But I made sure that I added, you know, even home exercise to my routine, kept, track of that, kept track of what I'm eating um, so that even though I don't have access to my normal routines, I can still supplement, make sure that I'm filling those parts of my life in and not just neglecting them altogether. Um, and yes, it takes some extra work because they aren't as accessible, um, but it's worth the work to maintain your own sense of normalcy and whatever feels like a normal structure to you, try and rebuild that. Um, so yeah, setting those, those kind of boundaries, giving myself that me time, um, and making sure that I keep my life in balance the way that I need to, to sustain healthy health and happiness. I love that. Hey, I, I found for myself personally that when I unplug, if I go for a walk in my neighborhood, it is incredibly blissful and mm -hmm. amazingly amazing how blissful life is. I notice the flowers, the sky, the birds singing, yep. everything. But if I go and turn on the news, it sounds like everything's going to hell and it's the end of the world. Yeah. And it, it's really interesting, the idea of which reality do we choose to exist in? 
mm -hmm. which reality we would choose to operate in. And I, it, you know, I've, I've wrestled with the same thing. Does it mean you don't care? Is it blissful ignorance? It's not at all. It's a conscious choice to make, right? Of just and, and it takes work. It's hard to turn off the devices. It's hard to unplug, especially because so many of our devices mm -hmm. have us so hardwired to for any sort yeah. of buzz, beep, ring, or ding. And I think with that isolation, loneliness piece, so many of us are getting connection through discussion around what's going on, current events, opinions. Yeah. When we when we argue or we bicker over stuff, it's a big emotional charge and it feels kind of yeah. good. And when we're wrestling with that lack of control, that grieving of the loss of control, it gives us something we feel like we can control, mm -hmm. you know, and it's it's such an interesting thing because, and so there's this alternate reality, one version of reality, it's so available and it seems like it can meet so many needs in a moment, but then it leaves all out of so massive, but it really is when we disconnect and we go and we shift our environment. It's amazing how different the experience can be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I similarly, I love being able to take walks. I live in a really small town in Nevada. So I always joke. It's like the Truman show <laughs> Half the time, like, especially at night, if I take a night walk, it's I, there's no one, <laughs> but it's beautiful. You know, we've got these beautiful, big open skies and yeah, you know, I know that there are problems in the world. And, and again, like you said, it doesn't mean I don't care, but it means that I, I need to care about my life. I need to know that there are beautiful things still and reaffirm the simple pleasures of life. Um, and, and when I am at a stronger state, that also puts me in a better place to address and perceive the news and be able to filter that and, you know, see what is kind of blown out of proportion and what is realistic, what I have power to contribute to or help and what is just you know that's a fact a matter of fact based on my position in the world you know yeah. um but yeah i think it's really critical and you know even aside from the news even you know social media can play a big role on our perspectives of ourselves um it's something we talk about a lot in our organization whether it be in the podcast or just uh, through the advocates because more often than not people are posting their absolute best self on social media and that's fine. That's what it's there for. It's a tool like anything else. But what happens when you spend too much time focusing on that is when you then look at your life, it's very easy to say, well, I don't look like that. I don't have that body. Well, I'm not eating all that fancy food. And we start to think worse about ourselves because again, it's, it's forming our perspective of things. And like you said, it's kind of this alternate reality, but it's not the full picture. It's not the reality of, of, of the things. It's the highlights, just like the news is the highlights, the worst case scenarios, um, but they're not showing you all the middle ground and life is full of the middle, um, so much more so than the extremes. And if we lose sight of that, um, we're way more likely to, you know, just be in a state of, of disarray and, and, and anger or frustration um, or even hopelessness because of what a bad perspective that can create for us. Yes. Smith, we're running near on our time. Before we ask my final question, where can people find and connect with you? Absolutely. Um, so our website is rethinkstigma.org. You can find us on uh, Instagram and all social medias at rethinkstigma. Um, if, uh, if you would like to check out our podcast, our Feel the Music podcast, that is on Spotify, so just Feel the Music. Um, and that's really the main things um, on our website. You'll see all of our initiatives. You'll see different ways you can get involved if this is something you're passionate about. Um, there's our advocate program, but we also have a pledge to rethink the stigma. Um, of course, we take donations. We are a nonprofit. Um, so there's lots of different things that you can do at different levels of interest. And again, our creative outlets as well. So feel free to check out our website and go from there. Very good. Samantha, I'd love to give people something tangible when possible to walk away from it. Folks who are listening, watching right now, and they're gonna, they're getting ready to log off and they're going to go back to whatever part of their day they're gonna engage in. But before they do that, they have, they have three to five minutes, maybe even two, to do something inspired by this conversation that's gonna make some sort of positive impact, positive difference in their mental and emotional well-being. What is one thing that they could do right now before they log off before they go back to life to that they could do that would help make a positive impact on their mental emotional well-being so one thing i really like suggesting um and it's simple and it's it's not easy per se but it's so beneficial um is go ahead and write a list of five things you are either proud about of yourself proud of yourself for or that you like about yourself 
Um, the reason I suggest this is because one of the underlying components to mental health struggles that ties into the shame component that ties into that suffering and silence is self-compassion. If we can give ourselves better self-compassion, if we can treat ourselves with the same empathy and support that we would our, our closest loved ones when they're struggling, then we really can begin to make changes to how we feel and how we approach our life really and the choices we mm. make. Um, it's something that is sorely missing. And again, it's so easy for us to lend a hand to a friend, to show compassion, you know, to tell a friend who, who's being hard on themselves, hey, don't be hard on yourself. You're so much better than this. You're so valuable. You're so worthwhile. You're a wonderful person. But when the tables are turned and we have that negative self-talk and we're feeling bad about ourselves or going, being hard on ourselves, it's so much harder for us to give ourselves that same support. So this is a great exercise. You can have this list handy. You can remind yourself of these things on a daily basis, but go ahead and really think through things that you love about yourself, that you're proud of yourself for, that make you unique and special and the wonderful, valuable person that you are. I love that. <laughs> Everyone, we're going to want to rewatch and re-listen this one. Samantha took us on an incredible journey where we talked about really working through the shame and identifying what are some of the contributors of shame and the societal opportunity to address and deal with the stigma of it once and for all. She shared with us some strategies that we could begin implementing to help boost our mental and emotional health, talking about writing and the power of just getting it out and how it almost gives you a, it gives you permission just to kind of, you know, use Johnny's analogy if you want. If it feels like flushing the toilet, it's getting rid of the crap and giving you space for something new and different. I love the idea that, you know, once you start to work through the shame, you find that there's more proactive approaches we can do. And that's really the the kind of crux of so much of this, right, is we feel so helpless and powerless because we feel so isolated and alone. It's almost like the feeling of being on an island, you're surrounded by ocean, no land, no boats, no anything in sight. And then once you're able to kind of process through that, it's almost like turning around and realizing that there is land behind you all along, that there is a harbor over there. You may, it's say might still be a ways away. You might still have to figure out how to communicate and get word over there. But the point, the more important thing is, is that land is in sight, that possibility exists, that hope is available now. And when we're struggling with shame, when we're sinking so deep into the depths of it, which society has horribly reinforced in so many ways, it seems like it is such a hopeless scenario. I love the idea of disconnecting too, my goodness. I, I'm one that definitely values social media. It creates opportunities for me to connect with folks like Samantha and it is blissful, amazing how blissful life can be when we turn in and disconnect from our devices and we just really get present to what and who's around us in that moment, especially if it's going out in nature or doing something like that. And remember that if you're in the Las Vegas area, December 4th, be sure to check out the music festival. It sounds like it's going to be a really incredible experience and what a beautiful way to have start to reintroduce live music back into our lives to do something that's proactive in, in addressing mental health, shattering these stigmas and helping uh, yourself and others not suffer in silence as they go forward. Samantha, this has been incredible to share this time with you. Thank you so very much for your, your generous contribution and the work you're doing in the world. Deeply appreciate you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. It's been so wonderful. Absolutely. And we will see you next time, everyone, on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye.